Uh, well, welcome everyone to this uh, lecture sponsored by the Friends of the Bodleian. The lecture is, as always, open to everyone, but if anyone would like to be a friend, uh, it's very easy to go onto our website and become one. All of the funds we receive go to conservation and acquisition uh, for the library. Now, it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Rain Jeffcott, who studied English literature at Cambridge, as indeed I did, uh, and library science in London. From 1981 to 1988, he worked at the Munster uh, University in Germany, working on the catalogue of English books printed before 1801, held by the University of Gottingen the final volume of which uh, was produced in 2017. In 1988, he joined the British Library as a member of the team compiling the English uh, short title catalogue, and in 1997, he became head of early printed collections at the British Library. In 2002, he returned to Germany as Director General of Berlin State Library. He moved to the Netherlands in 2004 to become Director of Nijmegen Air University Library, and in 2011, he took early retirement to write and lecture, and he now lives most of the year uh, in uh, Thailand. So, uh, I arrived back only on Sunday, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very <laughs> um, Graham has published widely in the field of rare books, library history, library management, and innovation. He has a special interest in Anglo-German cultural exchange, and has published a monograph on German printers and booksellers in 18th century London. His latest title um, on John Henry Botha and the early 19th century Anglo-German book trade is due out in early uh, 2020. So no book signings today, but it is on that very subject he is going to talk to us and I would ask you to give him a warm welcome. <coughs> Um, thank you, Dr. McCabe. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about this character, uh, John Henry Bote, um, or if you prefer, Johann Heinrich Bote. Um, I suspect the English called him Boat, I don't know, but um, um, if you think of his name as the equivalent of the, the straw hat, Bote, that's roughly the, um, uh, the way to pronounce it. Um, he seems to have been known familiarly as um, Heinrich or Henry, as far as I can, um, I, I can tell. Um, Bote was born in 1784 in Bremen, an interesting city, um, Hanseatic port, of course. Um, little is known about his family background, um, probably of the middling sort, of the, the better artisan um, sort. His father seems to have been a button maker, which is, is not a, 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 a profession to be sniffed at in the 18th century. Um, more important, um, he was a Lutheran. The family was Lutheran in a city which was dominated by the Calvinist merchant class um, during this period in, in, in the 18th century. Um, it was a bustling port city. You can get some impression of the bustlingness there. Um, and it was a good place for picking up enlightened ideas. Um, it was also a vibrant music and theatre scene. So it was, a, it was a city well connected to the wider world, including the world of the English speaking world to, to, to London. Um, a lot of trade to and from London, and that of course is important. He seemed, seems to have visited, sorry, to have attended, I should say, um, the Latin or grammar school at Bremen Cathedral. This was a Lutheran institution within Calvinist Bremen, and that's where he went to school. And it just so happens that the Scholach, or school director at the time, was a man called Freiherr Knicker. And any Germanists around um, um, uh, uh, in the audience will know that Knigge is an important figure in in, uh, in, in German enlightenment. In the German Enlightenment, he wrote the, um, the uh, most celebrated book of manners in in, um, in 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 18th century Germany. Now we don't know very much um, about his early life. Um, I assume, though I cannot prove, that he entered the book trade rather than going to university. Many of the 
um, uh, of his fellow students would have gone on to the Protestant Lutheran University at Göttingen, um, Hanoverian University at Göttingen. He seems not to have done, for whatever reason, but rather to have gone into the book trade, a respectable profession. Um, you have to say, and um, one where a knowledge, a grammar school boy with a knowledge of Latin would have done um, um, very well. And he did another thing which was common at the time. Um, I'm not going to make any remarks about politics today, so I won't mention the phrase freedom of movement. But anyway, he, he used that right that he had at the time to move to London, something which the Hanseatic um, youth um, did um, a lot in, in, in this period. Um, they say early in early life, and I think probably before 1806, which was when um, Napoleon imposed the so-called continental system on, on, on Anglo-continental um, trade. So he probably came in his early 20s. Um, don't know very much about um, his early contacts in the book trade. I know one or two names of people who came forward later to say that they'd known him in early life, but we don't know exactly for whom he worked um, in, in, in this period in London. Um, we do know something about um, his um, location. He was, um, in certainly in 1811, he was located in the parish of St. Martin in the Fields. And we know that because in that year, in July 1811, he married an Englishwoman, um, Sarah Lloyd, um, who we'll meet a bit later. <coughs> um, and this was often a prelude in, in, um, in, in, um, in the book trade, among foreign members of the book trade, um, to actually settling and forming a business and remaining in the country because you actually had a family tie. Also, of course, in 1811, Bremen was under French occupation. In fact, the French had made it a part of the French Empire, so going back to Bremen wasn't an immediate um, opportunity. Now, um, he um, opened his bookshop, his own German bookshop, or Deutsche Buchhandlung, at number three York Street, Covent Garden, um, a few months after getting married in early 19, uh, 1813. This is obviously an ideal location, you can imagine. Um, uh, York Street is now Tavistock Street. It's between Covent Garden and the Strand. The house is still there. Um, it's nowadays a restaurant, um, which um, an Italian restaurant, um, uh, and it's well worth going to see it. You, ca you can just about get some sense of the shape of the, the original shop, um, um, which was Boater's shop um, in, in, uh, in the early uh, 19th century. I have to say that the um, first shop that he um, acquired was number three York Street, um, and he moved next door to number four York Street, which is this building, some years later as his business expanded. So that's the, um, the shop I will probably be referring to. And it's now 36 Tavistock Street, if you want to go and have a look. You can't miss it, as we shall see later. Um, while he was there, um, he specialised, obviously, in importing German books and German editions of the Greek and Roman classics, but he also combined this business with um, a German circulating library, the Deutsche Leserbibliothek. Anyone, I'm sure everyone has read my last book, will know that the Deutsche Leserbibliothek had been um, the name of a circulating library on the Strand a, dec a decade or so earlier, um, but he opened a new one in, um, in, in about 1815. But he wasn't content with that. Um, this is Leipzig. This is the, the, um, uh, the marketplace in Leipzig in the early 19th century because Leipzig was his other great centre of operation. London and Leipzig. Again, I'm not making any political <laughs> points here <laughs> at all, but he was certainly someone who had a, um, an Anglo-continental trade. Um, 1813, um, you'll recall, at the so-called Battle, uh, Battle of the Nations, or the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon was defeated by Allied forces and driven out of Central Europe. And Bota and one or two other London booksellers took an immediate opportunity to travel back to Germany and attended the Easter Book Fair of 1814. 
The book fair in Leipzig was, of course, the center of the book trade, of the uh, German-speaking book trade in the period, where publishers and, and, and booksellers came together to um, exchange uh, news, gossip, information, agree deals um, on, on books, and, and so on and so forth. So it was absolutely um, the location to be if you were um, dealing with the um, German book trade, the German language book trade, in the same way that London certainly was the center of the English-speaking book trade in this period, and Bota clearly, ha clearly had a... Um, um, an ambition to uh, straddle the two. Um, now, all of this might be a little surprising, um, what I'm about to say, but um, by 1820, there were, in fact, five um, specialist booksellers. There's five booksellers in London specialising in the import of German books. Um, so, Bota had um, um, four rivals, some of them very substantial, who we may, may discuss, uh, discuss later. Um, all of them were attending the Leipzig Book Fair by 1820, and all were represented by members of the Leipzig trade within the German book trade. So um, that may be a little bit surprising, but um, um, uh, that is the case. In fact, one of the, one of the firms, the firm Longman, um, which was attending the um, Leipzig Book Fair by 1820, wasn't actually a specialist importer of German books at all. So they obviously saw the importance of, um, of the German market and of Leipzig as a way into the German market. Now, um, in Bota, <coughs> in, in 1814, Bota had engaged this gentleman um, as his commissioner, commissionaire, his agent in Leipzig and therefore in the German book trade. And this, German, uh, this gentleman happens to be Georg Joachim Gerschen. Gershon was one of the most celebrated um, literary publishers of his age. Um, he was coming, at this point, up to retirement. He had been Goethe's publisher until Goethe dropped Gershon and went to Cotter um, instead, the, the um, pub famous publisher, um, Cotter. He was actually from Bremen, so I do wonder if they had an earlier connection um, um, before, um, perhaps, um, Bota did an apprenticeship with Gershon in Leipzig before coming to London. Unfortunately, I have no evidence uh, for that. Um, yes, as I said, he also met on his first visit to, um, um, to, to Leipzig in 1814, he also met Johann Friedrich Kotter, the most eminent publisher or literary publisher in Germany in the period, the leader of the trade, you could say, um, with whom he formed a very close connection. Um, in fact, in 1815, Cotter sent his son back to England uh, with Bota um, to study the London book trade. In fact, uh, a number of booksellers, uh, uh, um, um, uh, Leipzig booksellers, did the same in the next few years. They sent their sons, apprenticed um, sons, uh, with um, Bota back to London to, to study the trade um, in England. Now, Bota attended the Leipzig Fair in most years after 1814, but not in all. By 1818, he'd actually got tired of, uh, of Gershon, who was coming up to retirement. Um, I have to say that Gershon was also the representative of one of his rivals called Black, not a famous um, London publisher today, but um, the Blacks, um, who actually had the premises up the road in Tavistock Street, were also using Gershon as... Um, um, as, as their um, commissionaire, their Leipzig uh, representatives. And we're very lucky that in Berlin, in the um, Gershon archive, we have copies of all the letters that Gershon sent to uh, Bota and the blacks um, in this period. So we have a good insight into um, the character of Bota, which could be rather prickly, I have to say, um, looking at the, um, at the letters, um, which are fascinating and, and play a, um, a strong role, I'd say, in my book. Um, in 1818, Zabota um, wanted to move on, um, and he moved on to another um, firm of younger booksellers called Steinacker und Wagner. Uh, and you have to say that um, this, essential, th this relationship with Steinacker and Wagner was essential to the development of, 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 of Bota's business within the German trade. 
By the way, after he visited Leipzig um, in, in, a, in, a, in a particular year, he would go on a long tour of other places in, in Germany and in the Netherlands. He had um, business connections in Amsterdam, in Leiden especially, with the fir firm of Luchtmanns, um, but also throughout Germany, of course. And he would meet, um, as we shall see, um, not just people in the book trade, but also um, writers and scholars, some of them quite extraordinarily eminent. So, um, what's the next one? Yes, um, you remember that we had a, a picture of his shop, which um, actually my partner made, on the basis of the modern shop, combined with um, this image that we have from, from um, I think, 1822 of, of Bota's shop, a um, rather splendid image. It was actually made by um, a man called Hulmandel, um, if anyone's heard of Hulmandel, who introduced lithography into England and wrote the first theoretical book of, 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 um, of, of lithography. Um, when you study Bota carefully, he seems to have known almost everybody in both England and in, um, and, and in Germany. So the 500-page um, <coughs> book is filled with his um, anecdotes about his connections. And very, uh, very entertaining they are too, by the way. So um, his business expanded rapidly, um, although um, competition was fierce in the field in which he specialised. Um, he also became a well-known person on the Lo in the London literary scene. He was on terms of friendship, according to his obituary, with a number of well-known literary figures. He corresponded with such grandees as Sir Walter Scott in, in Edinburgh, but also Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in Weimar. Um, behind the shop, there, there were kind of lodging rooms, rooms where you could lodge. Um, um, on two levels, as I understand it. And those were occupied in 1820, 1821, by someone called John Scott, who happens to have been the Scots editor of the London magazine. Um, Scott was one of the most important literary figures in, in London in the period, which meant that all those famous romantic writers that you've ever heard of traipsed through the shop to get to... Um, to, to Scott's um, office at the back of the shop, including um, Keats and, and, well, anyone, Lamb, anyone you've heard of, um, was writing for the London magazine at the time. Now, Scott was um, um, famously um, uh, killed in an accidental shooting. Actually, it was, the, it was supposed to be England's last, um, um, England's last duel at Chalk Farm. Something went terribly wrong. Scott was, um, was, was fatally wounded. And the rooms remained um, empty until they were occupied by someone else. And that was Thomas de Quincey. And it was in Bota's lodging rooms that de Quincey wrote Confessions of an English Opium Eater. The, um, relationship between them is well documented because I think it's the Clark Library in California has Bota's letters to, um, 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 oh sorry, De Quincey's letters um, to and about Bota. So um, um, it, that, that's another very good source. Um, the relationship wasn't good, as you can imagine, because Bota didn't, um, uh, Sarah Bota was annoyed by um, De Quincey's coming home late at night and clattering about in the house. And, um, and, of course, De Quincey, as you can imagine, was often drunk, um, a drug addict, and famously, and also um, didn't want to pay or couldn't pay his, um, his, his, his um, bills. Yeah. So, um, while he was at, while De Quincey, De Quincey was, what was it, De Bota's, uh, was it Bota's, um, uh, was Bota's lodger for some months in 1821, um, not very long, although their association went, um, uh, went on rather longer. Um, while he was there, he was visited by Thomas Hood, who um, describes um, De Quincey's uh, so, uh, situation at the shop as being in something like a German ocean of books. And I pur purloined that phrase for the title of my biography of Bota, A German Ocean uh, of Books. You can imagine that in this very small space, and the book books must have um, seemed like uh, uh, an ocean one was, uh, which overwhelmed um, the, the visitor. Um, 
For a period in 1818 to 1819, um, Bota actually ran the business in partnership with two young Englishmen, though that uh, partnership was, was soon dissolved. He discovered there were problems. He soon discovered it was better to do things independently on your own and not to depend on, on others. In, um, in 1819, he um, became the supplier of English books to the newly founded library of the University of Bonn. This was um, um, Prussia's answer to Göttingen in, in the west of Germany, Bonn University Library. They appointed someone called Friedrich Welke as, um, uh, as the librarian uh, and uh, also doubled up as the museum director, the professor of uh, of antiquarian studies and various other things. Um, the relationship between the two um, um, started off formally and got worse over the years. We, we will come back to it later. But um, Bonn very nicely um, kept all of Bota's letters um, and we also have the, um, um, the ledgers, um, the university library's ledgers and his bills and so on and so forth. So um, it provides another very nice source for Bota's, uh, Bota's business. And this is an example of one of his letters, his signature at bottom right. Um, yeah, he's written it on, is, does it say the 7th of London? Uh, can't see from this angle, April the 7th, 1824 towards the end of his life, and um, this is his characteristic uh, handwriting. Um, yes, I'm sure, um, um, not very, I know Professor Flood and, and pr probably a number of the other scholars in the room can read that, but uh, there are not many people in Germany nowadays who um, find it easy to read the old uh, German script. Okay, in early 1820, um, Bota received a particularly interesting distinction. He was made bookseller to the king, foreign bookseller to his majesty the king. And of course, he immediately plastered um, uh, the royal arms over his um, letter, um, his, his um, headed paper, note paper, bills. It, if you remember, it was stuck on the front of the house as, as, as well. And here on the only surviving um, example I found of his business card. This is actually um, in the Luchtmann's <laughs> archive in, in, in Amsterdam um, that I found this. And, and you can see um, 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 all the information there. Um, J.H. or I.H. Bota and Company, booksellers and importers of foreign classics and German books to His Majesty. This is slightly odd. Um, I, I, I've um, been in, in working closely with Jane Roberts, um, who many of you will know is the, um, the former librarian at Windsor on, on, um, on, on this, um, because he didn't actually sell very much to, um, to the Royal Library, by which was meant the, um, the old King's Library of George III. Um, it seems to be more of a distinction that they gave him. He certainly um, did things for royal persons, which um, where they need an agent in the book trade, rather than, um, that than, than actually meaning he was purveyor of lots and lots of books to the court, which he doesn't seem to have been. So that, that, that's interesting. But of course, it, 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 um, uh, he was a relatively young man, not yet 40. And um, this meant that uh, this was an enormous prestige um, thing for him. Um, particularly in Germany, of course, where um, a certain snobbery um, about um, um, titles and, and connections with, um, with the aristocracy um, pertained. Not that it didn't pertain in England as well, but there you are. Um, yeah, so you can see um, um, the portfolio of products um, that he offered was, was um, uh, essentially foreign, the import of, of foreign classics and German books. He was, of course, a general book sh bookseller in London as well, so you can pop into the shop and not just German books, but also English publications, which we should come to uh, later. Now, very surprisingly, his ambitions didn't stop there. In fact, it never stopped. It only stopped when he died. Um, in 1816, he acquired Cook's Classics. Now, Cook's Classics meant that he went from being sort of zero in, in terms of the English book trade to being probably, according to uh, contemporary accounts, the most um, um, prominent 
publisher in England <laughs> because Cook's classics, the, these um, uh, pocket books, I have an example here, um, um, pocket-sized books, the, um, um, I suppose the remote ancestor of, of, of um, or, 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 or penguin books um, and, and cheap paperback series um, were stereotyped. They were easy to produce. They were um, um, with, the, with the new technology. And you, um, it is said that they were the only publications you could find in every London bookshop. London bookshops <coughs> were very specialist at this time. You needed to go to a different bookshop um, for a different subject. Longman did. Um, law and, and another one did theology and so on and so forth but the, these apparently were present in every um, every shop and 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 from 1816 they um, were um, boaters property it is it is said um, he also marketed them very heavily in in Germany because they are stereotyped um, of course boaters in imprint rarely appears on them so it's very difficult to know if you have a copy of um, of Cook's, one of Cook's classics, whether it is um, one of Boater's or not. And I, and I happen to have this example um, at um, the bottom. You can see it says, can you see it? It's very small. It says, published 1817 for I.H. Boater. Um, th there is another title page with Cook's um, imprint as well. So this is a very rare example of, of uh, a physical example of, of, of um, uh, of what he did. Um, he also marketed in England another stereotype series of great historical importance, the um, classical texts published by um, someone called Karl Tauchnitz. Now, many of you will have heard of Bernhard Tauchnitz, the famous Leipzig publisher who um, printed and published those, those um, continental uh, editions of English books. Uh, later in the century, he was the nephew of Karl Tauchnitz, who in fact um, started the whole thing off by um, 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 publishing um, very well produced, stereotyped uh, editions of the Greek and Roman classics, which went like hotcakes in, in anywhere in, um, in 19th century Europe, um, where of course the classics were still the staple of, of, of public school and grammar school education. Um, and um, needless to say, Mr. Boter was the English agent for Tauchnitz um, in, 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 the early, um, in, in the early 19th century. <coughs> um, he also did things like this. Now, this makes him really interesting and significant. Um, uh, this is um, one of the plates from a, um, an, a, an a series of so-called outline illustrations to Goethe's Faust. You can see, Metaf can you see Mep Mephistopheles in, yes, at the back, um, chatting up a lady at the back, and Faust with Gretchen, I suppose, in, 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 in the front. These were enormously popular in um, the 1820s and 30s and so on and so forth. And um, uh, these were published by Cotter, um, and by arrangement distributed um, by Bota in England. But Bota wasn't satisfied with doing that. He wanted his own edition with English explanations of the plates. And he um, uh, commissioned George Soane, the um, ne'er-do-well son of, of John Soane, the architect, um, who was, in fact, a, a very competent Germanist. Um, and um, uh, they produced a very successful um, best-seller edition of these plates with, um, with, with English explanations. This led on to um, um, a, a big plan that Bota had to publish a bilingual edition of Goethe's Faust, um, English and, and, and German, um, and, and which w was to be translated by uh, Sohn. Unfortunately, Sohn was, as I said, ne'er-do-well, and did only 600 lines, although they were quite good as such. Um, a Bota's project, um, unfortunately, didn't get as far as it should have been. But he did publish the first edition of um, Goethe's Faust in England, uh, in, in 1823, which was also said to have been a big success. So um, um, Goethe's Faust in England, in German, in 1823. Um, his ambitions did not stop there, in fact, as I said, they never stopped. Um, another 
surprising development is that he published um, a list of, um, as it says here somewhere, works in natural history. Um, he um, was the publisher of John Lindley, who, if there are any, are there any horticulturalists in the audience, you will know that John Lindley was one of the, um, uh, the, the fathers of the uh, Royal Horticultural Society and also uh, the father of English orchidology. All of his early books were, were, were published by Bota, so we've gone a long way from German and, and Latin classics to, to, to something quite different at all. And we get even farther away. This here um, is not a great um, um, ornithological illustration, but it's quite, quite nice. Um, th this was um, a very important classic in the history of Australian bibliography. Um, this was the first book to be engraved in Aus colonial Australia in Sydney around 1813, um, I think it was. Um, it's, um, the, the artist engraver was called John William Lewin. Um, on his title page, he always, it always says, late, late of Parramatta, New South Wales. I, I actually went to Parramatta about a year ago to see what it was like. Um, he died and his widow brought the plates back to England where she, um, for reasons unknown, she found, um, presumably because Bota was establishing himself as a natural history publisher, she walked into the shop and uh, the rest is history. Bota published um, um, the two um, uh, best sellers, the Lepidoptera of New South Wales and this one, the Bird of New South Wales and the early um, copies would have been um, hand-coloured to order by uh, Mrs. Lewin and her daughter in, in, in London. These, by the way, are by, by far the most expensive his, of his publications today. Um, they go for t multiples of tens of thousands of, of, of Australian dollars. To um, I, I went to the Mitchell Library in Sydney and looked at um, their collections. They have multiple copies of things with bibliographical problems which would keep a bibliographer um, um, busy for, for decades. I only had an afternoon, I'm afraid. Um, right, so that, 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 was, wh that was that. But it wasn't just literature and books that he was interested in. He was also passionately um, attached to um, uh, the music of Karl Maria von Weber, who he met in Dresden in 1822. And Bote, it turns out, was the man who brought Der Freischutz, the great um, 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 romantic opera, you could say roughly the musical equivalent of Faust in, in the drama, I don't know. But he brought that to England um, and, and in the um, months before he died, he actually experienced it on the stage at Covent Garden. This is, um, I think, a flyer for, um, um, for the performance um, about a month after he died. So, um, yeah, you can see the kind of range of his interests and, 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 his, uh, and his ambitions. Um, it is said that Bota uh, um, advised on the production details, so he, he had a, a hands-on um, um, role in putting on this, uh, this opera. Now, um, I mentioned that he went on uh, regular and prolonged trips to Germany to attend the Leipzig uh, Easter book fairs. And, um, and, and, and obviously this, this was all a part of his ambition to become a major exporter of English books to the continent. Um, from 1818 he was distributing regular lists of, of imported English books for the German market. Um, and according to Leipzig trade directories, he was the only London bookseller whose publications were available between the book fairs all the year round. In other words, he had established a relationship with his, London, his Leipzig commissioners, Steinacker and Wagner, which enabled him to say, I am omnipresent in this market in Leipzig um, all the year round. And this is an example of um, a, um, a very rare example of a catalogue produced um, by his printer, uh, Gottlieb Schulze in Poland Street in London, um, for, um, for taking to, um, um, to, to Leipzig to be handed out um, with a list of new English publications for the German market. 
and it goes on and on and on. Um, Shakespeare, um, he um, didn't only promote um, Faust in England and Freischutz, he also promoted Shakespeare in the original language in Germany. Um, so this again is, is um, an addition um, that he, um, he, he um, published, um, stereotypical um, printing, um, which he had published in, in Germany, a single volume, original language Shakespeare, which um, um, was also very, uh, very successful, um, it, is, it is said. <coughs> um, by 1822, he was in fact intending to establish a permanent presence for his business in the German trade in, um, by, by opening a branch in Leipzig. He wasn't able to do that at the time um, because he couldn't find the staff, he tells us, to, to actually do it. He, he couldn't find people with the management competence necessary to leave them in charge of the shop in Leipzig while he was, uh, while he was absent. And, um, but he hadn't given up the ambition um, by the time he, he died. And just to, to rule, um, go further with his ambitions, one of the, his literary contacts was this gentleman who was Washington Irving, the American writer, long uh, resident in, in Europe, of course, um, um, a Murray author, and, and Bota met uh, Irving in, 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 um, I, uh, at Murray's, and um, is said to have discussed um, his new ambition, which was to open up to the American market, um, the transatlantic market. So he straddled not just the North Sea, he also, his vision was also to straddle the Atlantic, but unfortunately, although he didn't do that, although I have to say his apprentice um, actually did go to New York and opened a bookshop in New York uh, later um, after he died. Now, his ambitions go on and on. He was also interested, he wanted to be recognized as a scholar not just as a bookseller, but as a scholar. And the way that he did that was to produce scholarly catalogues or catalogues which were to double up um, as um, not just as, as, as trade catalogues, but also as bibliographies um, of, of use to, 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 to the scholar. Um, in 1817, he published um, um, a catalogue of all the editions of the Greek and Roman authors which have appeared in Germany. So that was supposed to have a scholarly use as well as a trade use. In 1821, he announced the publication of a bibliographical dictionary of English literature which was supposed to be written by someone called John Hulbert Glover, who was one of his business partners. And if um, Jane Roberts was able to be with us today, she would put her, well, she would be waving at this point because he's the man that we've been working on. He went on to be Queen Victoria's librarian at Windsor, so he's quite an interesting character. Um, but um, unfortunately, the, the, the great project, um, a bibliographical dictionary of English literature, failed in the way that the Faust project had failed. Um, so there's some evidence of it here in this building or in the other the building um, or in the John Johnson collection we have a, a, a prospectus for the project. At the time of, um, of, of um, where have I got to, no, um, at the time of his death he was working on a so-called Handbibliothek der Deutschen Literatur. This was supposed to be a, a conspectus of German literature um, um, which um, would in, inform um, um, scholarly users and um, the English public and so on and so forth about um, the totality of literature in the German language um, uh, that, were, that was available. He didn't finish it at the time by the time of his death and they only published and were able to publish only the first volume of it which we will come back to uh, later. Now in his final years he was um, uh, in financial difficulties you have to say his ambitions had outrun his resources, you might say. He was too dependent on his own, um, uh, on, on his own energies um, and wasn't finding the um, collaborative partners he would have needed, perhaps, to, to achieve his ambitions. Um, he was arrested in, uh, in 1823, briefly, for a, in a dispute with two other um, uh, merchants or, or business people about a, a bill of exchange. There's a big chancery, uh, there was a chancery case about it, um, all very unpleasant. 
1824, um, he, uh, when he was in Leipzig for the fair in, in, uh, in 1824, he decided he'd been very ill. He writes about a severe indis in indisposition um, from which he had just recovered. And he says he, I, this, this indisposition was occasioned by disappointment and over fatigue. So he was obviously exhausted by um, early um, 1824. He celebrated his 40th birthday in February that year. So in 18 um, after his birthday, he fell quite seriously ill and, and felt he needed to write a will, just a very short will, um, which wasn't witnessed, I have to say, in Leipzig, um, leaving his money to his property to, um, to Sarah, his wife. And he died suddenly in York Street <coughs> in, um, during a heat wave in September 1824. So he was just 40 and a half at the time. He'd had another short, severe bout of illness, an intestinal illness. Um, not quite sure whether it was amoebic dysentery or what it was from the sketchy... Um, um, uh, reports that we have. Um, it so happened that the um, young Norwegian scholar called Christian Lassen um, was his lodger at the time. Christian Lassen was the, um, the, the protege of one of the great scholars of the age, August Wilhelm Schlegel. And, um, and, and Lassen, um, Lassen's correspondence with Bota is, is an important, or, or with Schlegel, is another important source. This um, is an example of one of the letters which has been preserved from Bota's correspondence archive. Um, in unfortunately, in common with most early 19th century book members of the London book trade, with the well-known exception of Murray and, and some others, um, we don't have the ledgers, the, the um, account books, the, the uh, letter books, correspondence files and all the rest of it that we, that we would like to have. Um, but we do have remnants of the incoming correspondence. This seems to have been kept together until um, the... Um, uh, end of the 19th century and then made available through a series of booksellers, um, antiquarian uh, and autograph sellers, um, through the 20th century. And in fact, you can still buy um, um, examples of, of, of incoming letters to Bota um, today from, from a London-based um, 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 autograph or, or antiquarian bookseller, Richard Ford. Simon will know um, who, who that is, who, who with whom I've worked and, and acquired a number of items, um, which I'll come back to later. But this shows an example of, of, of um, how Bota's, um, how Bota, Bota worked. You can see at the top, I'm not sure if this, I can do a point, but anyway, if you look at the, um, if you look at the stamp, you can see that the, the, the the stamps that he, um, it was um, written in, 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 it was sent in 1820, uh, sorry, on the 20th of February 1824 from Bonn by, by, Sch uh, by Lassen, who was in Bonn. If you turn your head that way and look uh, on the left, you can see it was received at the Foreign Post Office in London on the 26th of February 1824, and, um, and, and uh, it was in fact de delivered on the same day to. Um, to Bota in, um, in, um, in, in uh, York Street. What he did was to the incoming, uh, he filed them by folding them into a docket and then mark it, mark it, uh, marking them at the top. As you can see at the top, there's the year, 1824. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Then it says Bonn, February the 20th, the date that, it, uh, uh, that Lassen wrote it. Christian Lassen, the, the person who wrote it, received 26th, um, and then it says, uh, uh, February, it must mean, and then it says, answered, that is, you have to believe me, A-N-S-D, stop, same day. Bota liked to um, uh, answer the letters on the same day, unless they were from particularly pesky people, in which case he left, um, left it for several weeks. Um, but here you are. So there are examples I've, I've seen, probably about two-thirds of the um, extant examples, uh, many, unfortunately, have disappeared. So the um, autograph hunters must have bought up um, the Goethe letters, for example, or the Scott letters, and those have disappeared, I assume, into, into private 
um, private collections, which is uh, rather unfortunate. <coughs> Now, when he died, um, death notices appeared in, 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 in many English and German publications um, praising his, um, uh, his personal affability and his integrity, his support for writers and scholars, and particularly his promotion of German literature in England. This, um, his business was immediately um, continued by his wife, Sarah, and this is the circular which he had um, Gottlieb Schulze print for the German, for, um, German market. Uh, if you look at the bottom right, it says uh, Johann Heinrich Bote's Selige Witwe. Um, and at the bottom it says, um, um, I think it means gezeichnet or something, or und geschrieben. Um, and then um, Lloyd, that was her maiden name. Why she signed with her Lloyd, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, no, sorry, it sa actually says geboren, born. Uh, so, nay, Lloyd, I'm not quite sure why she did that. Um, but she essentially says that um, the company is going to continue under the name um, J.H. or I.H. Boter's uh, Hof Buchhandlung, Court Bookshop. Um, um, and she got very, within three weeks, she got a confirmation of her, um, or, or of the royal warrant. She was um, um, authorized by the court to continue um, styling herself um, um, bookseller to the king, which is quite uh, quite interesting. So she must have had good um, some good um, contacts. Um, things didn't go well. She spoke no German. Um, she'd never worked in the bookshop. She had no business experience. We we um, have no evidence that she. I think she went with her husband once, perhaps twice, to Germany. Um, but she had no particular business experience. She was the hostess. She was the person who kept the, um, the, the, um, his private life going while he was so active in business circles. She was totally reliant on, on, um, on German-speaking staff in the London shop, and they proved, I'm afraid, not to be up to the job. Um, she had to fire someone um, um, quite early on. Um, she got advice from a, from a solicitor, from a German-speaking lawyer based in London, and finally in 1826, it was um, all a little too much, and she decided to sell off the business, um, transferring the current orders to one of the competitors and liquidating the stock and the British Library has copies of the auction, um, the auction catalogues um, where we can see um, who bought what, although a lot of the material actually doesn't appear in the auction catalogues. Um, and the explanation for that is almost certainly that the German stock was bought up by a young Swiss who continued the German bookshop in London um, for, for um, and, and it went on in that way for another few, um, few decades. But he had built up, Bota had built up a considerable legacy in both London and Leipzig. And it was his ideas that were more important than the, 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 the others. The idea of marketing um, cheap, stereotyped editions of the classics um, in England, in Germany, um, and, and so on and so forth. These things um, um, obviously had taken off. And it's no coincidence that one of the best known booksellers of 19th century London Henry George Bone, who was, of course, the son of one of, um, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, Bota's rivals, actually acquired the old premises in York Street in 1831. And he exp expanded them into, into his famous English and Foreign Library of the Fine Arts, Natural History, and Belle Lettres. Can you see that? Um, so the, the shop, the, the modest shop front with the bow windows, um, um, became like that, and that's essentially how you'll find the, um, the, the, the um, buildings, uh, buildings today. And um, with the Royal Arms, can you see Henry G. Bone and the Royal Arms and so on and so forth. So Bone was essentially working uh, in um, treading in, in, in Boater's um, footsteps. Um, in Leipzig, um, he also had um, uh, successors. Um, I don't have time to, to, to tell you how that process worked, but certainly the, his idea of stereotyping English classics sounds very familiar. If I mention again the name Tauchnitz, 
in um, the, later, uh, the later 19th century, you can see that um, his example lived on. So to sum up, we have a relatively brief career um, um, from 1813 um, through to only 1824, so that's not very long, is it, in which he seems to have done an extraordinary amount to um, promote the reception of German literature in England and the reception of English literature in Germany and um, more generally to promote um, British-German uh, cultural exchange. He also had um, something that we've not been able to discuss at all, um, a considerable impact on the German-speaking community in England. <coughs> um, this was, of course, a momentous period, uh, 1813 to 1824, the post-Napoleonic period, um, was when all sorts of interesting things were going on. The um, re-establishment of the conservative regime after the collapse of the Napoleonic, uh, um, um, the Napoleonic system, uh, economic depression, um, all sorts of problems in, in both England with sort of the radical demonstrations, the Peterloo massacre 1819, the Cato Street conspiracy in Germany, there was, it's called Vormerz, this period, the, the preliminary period to the 1848 revolutions, all sorts of, uh, of, of, of things going on in this period. And it just happens that his, um, I would say, enemy, but um, maybe overdoing it a bit, um, um, this gentleman here, th this is Friedrich Welke, who was the um, uh, university librarian of Bonn, a, a very interesting um, man, um, rather difficult, um, as we've seen, didn't want to pay the bills um, for the books he ordered, but he was actually also quite radical um, and suspect by the Prussian government of, of, of radical activities and had that hanging over his head for um, several decades, I think. So uh, this was a, a period where you needed to negotiate your way through, um, through, through governments uh, and, 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 and politics quite, quite carefully, and that in two countries. Um, as it were. <coughs> um, this is an example of a, uh, of, of a Bota imprint. Um, how should we sum up? Well, people have said that um, he, he was an aggressive entrepreneur. Um, I think that may be a slight exaggeration. Um, not sure about the word aggressive, but he certainly was um, um, a very proactive and determined to um, realize the, um, the, the ideas that he had. Um, none of his activities was entirely unparalleled or indeed without precedent. What, what, what is unparalleled with him is the range of his activities and, and the, um, the short time that he, he tried, to, to, uh, he tried to, um, to, to achieve his ambitions. Um, Gentleman's Magazine has a, a nice obituary written by one of his circle of English literati. Um, I don't know who it was, I'm afraid. Um, was it De Quincey? I, I don't know. Um, but someone wrote um, um, an obituary, and it's worth quoting some of it. September the 2nd in York Street, Covent Garden, Mr. Boater, foreign bookseller to the Sin, uh, to His Majesty, of whom it is no exaggeration to assert that by integrity of principle, kindness of disposition, and suavity of manners, he had conciliated the friendship and regard of all who knew him. He was a native of Bremen, Bremen in Germany, and having settled young in this country, he showed in the business which he created and to the improvement of which he devoted all his energies how much may be accomplished by industry and perseverance. And, and, and so it goes along. So uh, he was well regarded, um, obviously, um, um, by his contemporaries. Um, and it so happens, the last five minutes of my talk is just to say something very briefly for the friends of the Bodleian Library, how important it turned out the collections of this, uh, this particular institution are, um, or were in my research. Um, they, we don't have here the depth of the, or the quantity of catalogues that they have at the British Library. Um, for example, we don't have anything like the archival um, um, collections that they have in, in Bonn or in Berlin, but we do have, for example, um, a very rare, I think the only example of, um, of, of headed, um, his headed paper here in, um, in, um, in the Bodleian um, Library archive. just happens that he um, um, wasn't favoured by the 
Bodleian librarians, and they only bought, um, I think, two, two or three items from him. Um, but um, one of those is, is um, documented in the archive here in, um, in, um, um, in, 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 in the Bodleian uh, Library. Um, he did have more success with the Radcliffe um, Library, which was, of course, an independent institution um, to which he sold a, um, a large range of material in the years between 18... 14 and 1824 and his successors as well. And um, I acquired some of the letters from the, um, that, um, um, that were written to him by the Radcliffe's librarian at the time, um, whose name now escapes me, George Williams, and uh, donated them to the, um, um, after I'd finished the research on my book, to the, to the Bodleian Library. So we have a nice little um, memorial of, um, of that. Um, there are only two copies extant of uh, this great 1822 catalogue with the Hulmandel um, lithography and the by far the better one. The one is in Florida, which I've not actually seen except as a photograph, and the one that we have here, which is um, a, a splendid um, in, in, um, um, example um, of, um, of a catalogue in its original um, dust jacket. So that's the right... Can we say dust jacket? No, it's, um, what is it, Simon, in the period? Well, whatever it is. What? Wrappers. Yes, it's a wrapper. Thank you. Um, on the title page thereof, um, it says, interestingly, um, if you can see at the top, Tubian Osiander. Now, the person at the Bodleian who catalogued this didn't know... Um, couldn't read it and didn't know what it meant. Osiander was in fact um, a major um, bookseller at Tübingen in southwest Germany and I assume that he must have acquired this copy um, from, uh, from Bote at Leipzig, at the Leipzig Book Fair. Seems he was at the Leipzig Book Fair, I, I, I checked, in 1822. Uh, how the Bodleian came to acquire it I don't know but it's a very interesting um, item to, to have. Um, this is the... Um, Bodleian copy of, of, um, of Bota's great bibliographic handbook, the Handbibliothek der Deutschen Literatur. Um, this was um, it's, it's, uh, with a preface by um, August Wilhelm von Schlegel, who was one of Bota's fans, um, you could say. Um, the Bodleian librarian has written um, on, I'm sorry, I, didn't have, I don't have a photograph, but, uh, has written on it, Keep because of the preface of Dr. Schlegel, Professor Schlegel. <laughs> Rather unfortunate, but uh, there you are. Um, yes. Um, what do we have now? Ah, right. And we come, I think this is my last item. Um, I have to ask whether, um, whether Dr. David Johnson is in the audience today from St. Peter's. Not, okay, I was hoping to see him today. Dr. Johnson <coughs> is the librarian at St. Peter's College, Oxford, and he has um, um, a copy of this in his collection, History of Sir Charles Grandison, um, published by Cook, republished by Bota, 1870. Dr. Johnson's got volumes one to four, and it so happens that for 10 euros, I acquired volume five <laughs> um, from... Yeah, which looks like this. Um, and um, I'm afraid there, there seem to have been seven volumes altogether, but um, it's all very curious. I can't explain it. Um, I, I was going to do that, donate that to St. Peter's College, and perhaps I could give it to the friends, uh, representative of the friends who could pass it on to Dr. Johnson, who I was hoping to see today, but there you are. Um, and that's really the sort of all of my story. There's a lot more interesting material in, uh, um, in the collections if I hadn't had access to the collections, the support of the librarians here, um, um, access to the John Johnson collection, and so on and so forth, then the book would have been much, uh, much poorer for it. Um, so I have to... Uh, a, a, a wide range of, of, of bodily and staff, I won't embarrass them by uh, mentioning them uh, now, who have actually helped... Um, along with the special collection staff, imaging staff, admission staff, and everybody else, in in, in helping me with this uh, with this project. On which note, I think I would like to thank you.